very proud to uh, to do work with a great team and work with fantastic volunteers like yourself. So thanks for coming out tonight. Um, tonight will be predominantly headed up by our colleague from the FA, Craig, who will um, introduce himself shortly. Um, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping, introduce some of the, the other Chester FA team members that are here tonight. Um, but first of all, again, once again, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, tea, coffee and biscuits. And I believe uh, Christmas has arrived because there's quality street on the table. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure when we'll get fed up of chocolate before Christmas. I think it's coming on soon. Um, if there are some missing, I believe Chris Barrow um, over there, the football dog manager, has been eating them. So apologies if you haven't got all your favourites. Um, in terms of that technical housekeeping, if, if there's no planned fire alarm tonight, so does the alarm go off? Um, fire exit there, and we'll just get some guidance from the staff. Uh, toilets are the other side of this partition. Um, if there's anybody got any particular um, issues tonight or any concerns or anything that they can't uh, see or understand, just give us a shout and the staff will help. And I just want to just quickly introduce you um, to the staff. Uh, Laura, do you want to just, um, you're new, aren't you? So yeah. do you want to just say a few words? Um, yeah, she's I'm new. How, how long have you been with us now? Four days. <laughs> Four days. And she hasn't left. So well, you might see my face around. we're all in around the Cheshire County um, but yeah it's a little introduction for me Look Brilliant. To well done I'm a really proud of the police happy so thank you over in the far corner is Vesta some of you might know Vesta Vesta looks after gives away Vesta Vesta looks after the investment next is Greg business development manager Greg is going to be looking after some comms because we've got a hybrid meeting tonight we've got some wonderful people in the room I've also got some people online how many people have we got online at the moment Greg 18 18 so a really good turnout so fantastic. And then we've got Gary. Um, I think most of you know Gary. So a bit of, bit of Gary's evening tonight, compliance and regulations manager. And Gary's able assistant, Mike. Mike, good evening. I think believe Mike welcomed you. And um, did you manage to um, stay out in the warm? Did you, Mike? Or yeah. Brilliant. Well done. And then we've got uh, Chris. Chris Barrow's a football development manager and um, has been eating chocolates since about six o'clock this evening. How are you feeling, Chris? Okay. Good stuff. Have I captured all the staff? Have I captured everybody, Chris? I think I have. I, I'm yeah. terrified of missing somebody. OK, so listen, tonight um, is your night. We're going to get some information to answer us questions and hopefully interact. I'd like to um, welcome a really good friend of Cheshire and someone who gives us lots of advice and support and an all round good guy. Uh, but don't ask him what team he supports, because that's where it starts to unravel a little bit. Um, if we no pressure because they're going to want to know now aren't they so if we give craig a warm welcome craig welcome Good evening, everybody. um i will tell you who i support it's on my side so seamlessly built in well done um i think you were given a time of around two hours now i don't think it's going to last two hours i work in discipline and if i've got to talk about discipline for two hours <laughs> it's a lot for me let alone yourself sat there so I will try and make it as quick as we can. But if you have questions and something isn't making sense, then please ask. So welcome to everybody online as well. And if you are online and you have any questions, then please post things in the chat if you have the chat function and Greg will monitor the chat. So that is me. And why I just put that slide up very briefly, I'm not going to talk through it, loads and loads and loads. It really is just to show at the bottom I am human and I say that because I work at the FA and it's discipline and people think it's quite robotic. I care deeply about football and I care deeply about what happens within it. And I have.
that they offer and how much they care about people. It is really, really good. So, husband and father of two boys, I volunteer, I fundraise, I'm a runner, sort of, in that I've just been doing a, a charity piece, a 5k every day for a year that I've just finished for charity. I don't have a county fan, and I now may have possibly been dragged in to become a coach of under sense. So starting from scratch, because my youngest has started football, so I'll be entering into the world of coaching and volunteering like many of you in the room. So, ground rules, just very quickly. I just want to set a scene with you all just for this evening. Be here now. I don't mind if you have phones on. I really don't mind if people have got calls that they need to take. Please feel free to do so. Phone goes off, that's fine. As long as the ringtone is not too offensive. I've had it before where a ringtone went off. It wasn't the most ideal ringtone to be hearing in the, in the room. Engage, it is your evening. Respect others' views, opinions and questions. Agree to disagree. If there is one thing that discipline is, it is quite emotive and it is quite divisive. The world that we're in in discipline, we very rarely can actually please everybody. Whatever decision we take, we're going to please one person, but in the same decision, we're going to actually upset somebody else. That is the world that we're in. It is a safe space that we want to create. If you've got questions to ask, please feel free and safe to ask those questions. I just ask it doesn't leave the room. OK, confidentiality. And leave baggage at the door. I don't mean leave your bags at the door. I just mean for tonight, you may have burning questions for Cheshire FA. And it may be very personal to you, but it's not to share with everybody else. So we can try and answer some of those things at the end. What I don't want to do is have to try to get tied up in those questions during the presentation for everybody else to have to listen to potentially something that's quite individual to somebody. Now, just very quickly, the Cheshire FA have entered into an agreement and a partnership with an organisation called the Joshua Tree. And this is really, really very special. The Joshua Tree is an organisation, a small organisation in Cheshire that caters for parents and for families and for children where children have been diagnosed with a cancer. It is reliant solely on funding, as I understand it. It doesn't get any funding from anywhere else through the government. It relies on having partners and it relies on people donating. As a parent, I genuinely cannot understand what it must feel like if your child was diagnosed with a cancer. And I hope I never have to. There is a QR code on there and there is a banner with a QR code. If it's quite personal to anybody in this room and you feel like you can donate a few pounds, please, if you could, that would be fantastic. What I also believe is that they want to enter into partnerships with clubs because they can potentially do something with a football club, which actually might be more valuable to them. Some sort of fundraising activity with local clubs in the areas. Maybe it's referees associations, maybe it's a league. So please feel free if you take the number or the detail, give them a call, see what is possible. They are quite small. They might not be able to cater for everybody. But please, it is really, really important. It's a really, really precious service that they offer. OK. Now. What I want you to do just to begin with, you can chat to somebody else in the room. Go and say hello to somebody else you might not know. Or please, if you want to feel safe space with somebody that you've come with tonight and speak to somebody you know, do that. There are some post-it notes on the table and there are two questions. If you're online, you can post these in the chat. But what I want you to do just for a couple of minutes is have a conversation about any questions you might have that you want addressing tonight. You were asked when you signed up, but there was quite a few people I don't think who did or didn't have any questions at that point. Because when you go tonight, I want you to feel like you've got answers to questions if you have got them. And also one key question there. If there's anything you'd change in the world of discipline, what would it be? One thing, no matter how bizarre it might sound, one thing that you would change that might make the game better. Pop them down on a post-it. And then if somebody either you might want to pass them to the front, somebody at the front, if you can take them over, there are two sheets where Gary's sat on the end there. One to put your questions on, one to put those things that you would change in the world of discipline. OK, so take a couple of minutes to do that for me.
Okay, just about 60 seconds longer. If you can get something on a fit shop, uh, I'll post it. Take them over to the table. Hey there. The last few were still writing. If we can just get those over on the Thank you very much.
concerned when we ask the question. If there's one thing you thought we'd change, what would it be? Because um, I don't want it just to just sound like a flip and throw away question. Because actually, some ideas that come from people like yourself actually are those that we can try to change, that those that we can try and take back and try and influence the lawmakers and the regulation makers. So we care deeply about what actually happens and we do try and drive for change constantly. Constantly try and drive for change. So thank you for doing that. There will be a little bit, a bit of a break later on. So what we'll do is we'll have a really good look at what they are and then at the end, there's chance for questions. And then we'll try and address some of those points that you've put up there. This is the thing that we're going to go through tonight. If you attended the Cheshire Rep Roadshow, we called it, the Discipline Roadshow, it was probably about 16 months ago now, in the summer of last year. The basis of tonight is very similar. Some things don't change in the world of discipline, but there are additions to what we presented on that evening. Looks like a really long agenda. We will get through it. Just in terms of organisational structure of the FA and myself and why we're here. We're a team of six people at the FA. I look after the North, 12 county FAs, but this team looks after everything that is category five in discipline. And category five means it is step five in adult men's football and below. And tier three in the women's game and below. And it also includes youth football as well. So it's a real big remit for football. The FA centrally then look after everything that is step four and above, and then the Women's Super League and the Championship. So in terms of the grassroots disciplinary process, just to let you know what actually happens to go through the process from start to finish, to give you some concept of what happens within the county FA. In terms of regulations, I've put this slide up. You don't need to make loads of notes because these slides will come out to you, OK, for reference. But these are all the charges within regulation that we look after within football. And it's quite regulatory speak, quite lawyer speak, OK? So E3.1 is general improper conduct. E3.2 is about aggravated breaches. So something that's improper, but it's further aggravated by a protected characteristic. E4 is about discrimination. E20 is about team officials, players, coaches, managers, physios, anybody that has a role within a team or the club comes under what we charge as E20. And then now separated out as a new regulation is E21. And E21 has split out now that E21 is everything that is to do with parents and spectators. Everything used to be crammed into E20. So team officials, parents, spectators, it was all, all an E20 charge. Split it out, E20, E21. So now we can get a general feel actually for how bad team officials might be and how bad parents might be. And it's really interesting to see which one is the most. So in terms of investigations and reports, anybody can report anything in football. You could be walking your dog at the side of the pitch. You could hear or see something that you don't think is right. You can report it. The county FA are then bound to investigate. The process is that the county FA can look at a report and charge on what we call a prima facie basis on reports. Does anybody know what prima facie means? On the face of it, yeah, on the face of it, Latin for on the face of it. So somebody could write a report, we don't need to investigate, it's thorough enough, we can raise a charge just on one report alone. It might be so straightforward, we raise a report, uh, we raise a charge. If it's not prima facie, can't GFA open an investigation? Yes. How do you justify investigating reports of, say, a dog walking to just made a, a statement of what they've seen and then take the sentence and prepare a club that and find it? How do you justify that? It's likely that if you were walking like your dog, probably, yeah, that, that words. 
it's like if you was walking your dog and you put in a report, it wouldn't become prima facie, it would be an investigation that Gary would or Mike would go to both clubs and say, we've had a report, it's been alleged that, and would then look at getting other, other versions of events from clubs, referees, people that are involved in that game. And what happens at the same club regularly that it's unlikely that you do prima facie based on somebody who is not potentially involved in that game as a participant because you would want to get a wider picture of what's happened. If a referee writes a report that is really efficient and effective, you're potentially going to raise a prima facie. If somebody reports a social media offence, prima facie because it's there on social media, you don't need to investigate because the report and the social media post is there in words. OK, so. It would be for the county FA to look at those and to then make a judgment call. Timeframes have changed. Previously, when a report came in, the county FA would have a total period on most cases of 180 days from start to finish. OK, people aren't happy about that. I can understand why, right? I can't remember sometimes what I've done yesterday, let alone what I've done six months down the line. However, it was there for a very good reason that there may well be factors and reasons they'd have to delay it for so long. Quite often, it might be that there's police involvement or this other organisational involvement and they have to delay. The statistics nationally have shown that county FAs don't need 180 days. Most cases nationally have been dealt with inside 90 days. So that's what we've brought it down to. So we've changed it for transparency, for people in the game, for customer service, that county FAs will take no longer than 90 days from the moment that they get an allegation to it closing. If they need longer, they ask for dispensation, but with very good reason, they ask for dispensation because they may need it because the police might have told them to stop. Okay. But it's rare, it's very rare. Less than 1% of cases last year took over 90 days. Okay. What has changed also is about abandoning matches. Now, for very good reasons, this has gone up. It used to be unrealistic for county FAs to deal with charges that centered from abandoned matches because they only used to get 28 days. And you'd go, 28 days, that's brilliant. It's quick, right? You get an answer. It's not long enough for them. And I'll explain why in a second. So what's changed with abandoned matches is this. The LTFA gets a period of 28 days to consider raising a charge. So they either have to raise a charge or it closes. They get a further 14 days to then close the matter. So they get a period of 42 days. Now, if they charge on day one, so referee referees the game on a Sunday, the report comes in Monday morning, the county FA make a prima facie charge because they don't need anything else, it's good enough. They still then get 41 days extra because it is a 42 day period total. What was happening last year is they charged on day one, they lost the rest of the period, they then only had 14 days to close it. So they only had 15 days as a process. That makes sense. That's impossible. It's pretty impossible. 15 days. It's it's really, really challenging, especially if when you charge, the person denies it and wants a personal hearing because you have to give that person 14 days notice in regulation for a personal hearing. So it's impossible almost immediately. So it's been extended to help the county FAs. And in terms of compliance, county FAs can raise charges against people if they don't comply. So a dog walker walks his dog, raises an allegation, county FA goes for observations and wants to know what's happened. And one club flatly refuses to comply with you and they refuse to give him any information. The county FA can raise a charge against that club for failing to comply in an active investigation. It is a rule and a regulation. And what will happen? potentially is when that charge is raised for non-compliance a panel can suspend the club's affiliation for not complying in an active investigation 
Anybody in this room got 50 teams in their club or more? 50 teams or more? Some big clubs in the room? Could be serious implication on that because if a club affiliation is suspended, that's 50 teams that cannot play football until the club complies. It is only used very rarely. I have to tell you that. I would dare say that the bigger clubs in the room who run will comply with investigations anyway, the way you are structured and the way that you would have communication with your teams. So, a little bit of an exercise and an experiment that I'm going to use to show you something. You can do this in twos or threes. People online can just do this on their own. What I want you to do for the next few minutes is just read the report that comes on the screen. Read the report and decide if you've got to go back to the referee and ask any more questions. What do you need from him? And do you need to make contact with anybody else? Or do you not? Can you actually just raise a charge based on what you're going to see on the screen as a prima facie matter? There you go. Have a couple of minutes. Read that. Do it on your own. Work in a two or a three. Write a few bits down and then I'll ask for a few volunteers afterwards, OK? I'm 
so if we take this um this report this is not uncommon all right, this is not uncommon, what Gary will receive after every weekend, OK? These are the kind of reports that County FAs will potentially get. So, somebody off that far table, do you want to give me one thing that you might need to go back and ask, if you have at all? More detail. Yeah, more detail. Too vague. Too vague. Any specific questions that you might need to ask? What was said? Word for word. Yeah. OK, what was said? Really important. If you're going to raise a charge, you need to tell the person what it is they're alleged to have said. Because they have to defend against it. The you amount. Swear words. Yeah, you have to write it verbatim if you can remember it or roughly what was said. Because. The amount of times we've seen cases collapse when it goes to a panel because they've been charged on, you abuse the rep and the person goes. Well, what did I say? And the case falls down because they don't know what they're alleged to have said. It's really important. Anything on this table here? Fine. Really important detail. What am I supposed to have said to him and when? When? Start of the match, end of the match. Anything on this table? Which team? Player. Teams? Doesn't even say what match. <laughs> yep. It says parents, but so whose parents? The, the, the lad's parents, or generally? Uh, yeah. And, and, and was, was the lad shouting abuse as well? Yeah, crucially, who's that person? Because they might be really important to this case, and there's no detail whatsoever. Yeah. So it's the day this. So they were shouting. Who, who are they? Yeah. Okay. This table. Anything else? Date of, date of the fixture and the actual call. Yeah. Date. Because Gary will get that and he won't even know when he's supposed to be looking at. What league, who, when? Really important. Yeah. Is there anything else? Yeah, much of what was said there, the exact location of this old, uh, how was he grabbed? It says we grabbed, it's slightly different from grabbing his wrist to grabbing around the neck. Yeah. Uh, and I put on there, stroke what was said. Uh, description of the parent, just come over and stop it. Um, age of the referee, age of the teams. Yes, they're all the parents there, aren't they? So we they really important. Really important. OK. All that's for is just to show you roughly what would happen. The county FA get this report. There is no prima facie argument you can make there. Because if Gary charges that, it fails immediately. But what happens, interestingly, is this. You get that report. Gary has to go back out and find that referee, which can take time because actually it might not be a priority because of how many other cases have come in that are really important. He will go out and ask, but have to give time. Might be that you give somebody five days to answer. That person comes back within five days or they might not come back at all. So Gary has to send a chaser. That person comes back and it's still quite a vague response and not all the questions are answered. So he has to go back out further. And by the time you've finished, 14 days might have elapsed. That's why it's really important around the quality of reporting. Because whilst the impression might be that the county FA are really slow in responding and doing things, this really doesn't aid them. Same matter, same incident, right? Just have a quick read of that.
So that addresses everything that you said. All those points you raised, it addresses everything you've said. What was the physical contact? How were they touched? How were they grabbed? Where did it happen? Who was the person who actually was the alleged offender? What were the teams? Description of the, of the witness. Gary could make a prima facie case out of that. He wouldn't because crucially, he did a witness makes the case a lot stronger when he's got contact details, which is brilliant. The referee's done an amazing job in that report. And it might mean that Gary can raise a charge within a couple of days rather than 10, 11, 12, 13 days of continuous communication with the referee. It's why it's really, really, really important. OK. So. Just to go on about victim support, individuals that are victims of misconduct matters. The county FA here have got something really special, OK? Something special that I haven't seen in all the county FAs to this detail and this level. Last year, the county FA addressed some of the concerns and some of the complaints that were coming in around lack of response, lack of care, lack of feeling to people. There is a pastoral programme that's in place. And three crucial people within that, Steve, Nadine, who isn't here tonight, unless she's told me enough, stuff, not mind. OK, hi, Nadine. <laughs> Did you get a wave? <laughs> she's probably not listening. Um, and Ryan, they cover everything from, as Steve is the CEO, Nadine is the designated safeguarding officer, and Ryan is the referee development officer. Victims will get support from the county FA. Email, call, whatever is needed, they will be looked after by the county FA. And it's crucial, really crucial. There is an FA funded programme for people that are the victims of discrimination and aggravation, serious offences, really serious offences, that potentially will extend to referees of any abuse that's physical contact or assault. Sporting Chance is an offer that the FA fund to a considerable sum nationally, where people can get sessions for free, so up to six sessions that you can have if you really feel like you need some support, that you really need support in a safe space, a confidential space. And then ultimately, it might be a self-referral to GP. However, the first two options, I'm sure, are probably the better ones, given that trying to get into a local GP is quite difficult, certainly is where I am. But there are opportunities there if anybody feels they need support. Please reach out, especially to Steve, to Nadine, to Ryan. So in terms of decision making on cases. Four crucial things. County FA might close it. They haven't got enough to meet what they believe is a threshold to charge to test the evidence. They close the investigation more as poor practice and potentially then the dean might reach out because it might be more about safeguarding and welfare. It might be closed, but actually with a mandate to order education. We can't raise charges against individuals that are under the age of 12 currently in regulation. But what we can do is still investigate the allegation. And if we think we could have charged if they were of age, we can mandate an education order which will mean that we go to the club and say, you have to do this. If you do not, you will be charged with non-compliance. If we don't think there's enough to raise a charge, we can go to the club and say, would you work with us and would you do this? It's not an admission of guilt because we're not charging you. Would you work with us? It's a free opportunity, a development opportunity for you and your team and your participants. If you choose not to, you choose not to. We wouldn't mandate it. You wouldn't be charged for non-compliance. We just ask you to work with us. You don't, you don't. Or we charge, we just charge the participant, whether that's the club, the team, the player. I've talked about serious cases and I've used the phrase serious cases. All misconduct is serious. I'm not saying something isn't serious, but it's just about a separation of power of cases. The county FA deal with a certain amount of misconduct cases, but the FA will deal with what we call serious cases. What will happen is Gary, Mike, they will look at the evidence, they will put the investigation together. If they believe they've got then enough to either charge or to close, they come to me. The best way of describing what I do is acting as CPS. I will look at their evidence, I will look at their investigation, 
and I will advise whether they've done enough or they haven't. So I will advise to go with their recommendation or I will say not to and I will tell them they need to do more. But confidence very rarely, very rarely do we disagree. Very rarely. And in fact, I don't think we've ever disagreed other than I might have asked for some extra information. But we've never got to a point where we've disagreed where I've said one thing and they've said another and we've done the opposite. So it works really well. And the serious cases are just listed down there, the ones that Gary and Mike have to come to me with a recommendation on, and then the FA then take them over and then deal with them in terms of appointing a panel to hear them. So it is aggravated cases, discrimination cases, assault cases, whether that's on a referee or participant, threatening a match official, and club charges that are serious because it might be that a parent has committed something by acting against the referee. The reason that we do those is because we need written reasons. We need to justify the decision we're given because they all come with quite serious sanctions. Assault on a match official can be 10 years. OK, so it has to be dealt with by a national serious case panel, completely independent panel, completely independent from the county, and that they'll write written reasons in such a way they are legally binding. So in terms of responding, when somebody's charged, it appears in whole game. It does appear in whole game. Yes. <laughs> uh, it does appear in whole game. Um, I know what people's views are about whole games. Sometimes. Um, platform for football is being built around discipline. Those that work with the system will know that you've been doing things like affiliation, a player registration. I would like to think probably been better and it's the best it's perhaps been. So I can only hope that discipline follows the same trend. There are lots of things that we're building into it around discipline. We know don't work and you've told us they don't because I've just had a look at some of those questions. So moving forward, charges will appear in what will be platform football. Clubs, participants will get a charge letter. It, it identifies a load of things around the date what they're alleged to have done, how long they've got to respond. And there are four options. Two of them that can either plead guilty. One that they accept their guilt and it's just heard by a panel, they don't turn up. One is that they plead guilty and they turn up to a hearing and they give a verbal plea for leniency. The other two are they deny the charge. One is that they deny it and they ask for a hearing where everybody turns up, including all the witnesses and the man walking his dog. Or they say that they are denying the charge and they request for it just to be done on papers alone. Nobody turns up. They just put in writing why they're denying the charge. Now, in terms of the hearing process. Normally, there's four people. They can actually be five. And there can be six because you can have more members, but normally it's four. One secretary who has no power whatsoever. They're just there to guide and advise. Two wing members and a chair. I know we've got some panel members in the room. They are now pretty much all independent, mostly, mostly, aren't they? Because the County FA access panel members from all around the north. So actually we can alleviate this query that there might be confliction. There might be somebody on a panel that's been there before that's hearing your case. When I first started in Knotts, I sat and observed the panel. And one of the panel members, their first opening line before the case started was, I can't believe he's here again in front of us. And I let the panel pan out. I observed it. I went back, had a look at his fence history in the system. He'd been charged five times in three years. And the person that said it had been on every one of his five cases. Now, is that fair? You're all going to go, no, I hope. It is completely not fair. That person on that panel already knows who that person is and already knows that they've been done four times because he's sat on their case. Unconscious bias, even conscious bias, because he knows. Not fair, that person's already guilty in his mind. They've all attended qualifications now. That never used to happen. In terms of... The only exception to that, where somebody pleads guilty on a serious case, it can be heard just by a chair alone because of their independence, their transparency, writing written reasons and the quality of that individual. 
the background that they come from. They can sit alone and view that case. I've mentioned about what the difference is, correspondence and personal hearing. One is just on papers alone, nobody turns up. The other one is you have people in the room with you to give their accounts. Now, this is where it's going to get interesting and I hope it works. We've tried it, it worked earlier, it's now bound not to. <laughs> Just watch these clips. You are going to see a hearing process and I want you to think about everything you see that is fundamentally wrong. It's quite an old clip. Sounds not coming through. I've got to try to bring it back to the first clip. There we go. I see this is Okay. Show my age a little bit here. That was filmed around 20 years ago while I was working at the Knotts FA. And just when that lad walked out, there was a door opposite that was our staff canteen, our kitchen, and I was on lunch. And I saw what was happening and going off and heard it and went up to the CEO going, you're not going to believe what's happening downstairs in this discipline panel. He was like, you do know they're filming. And somebody told me that lad was out of Corey, Simon, out of Corey. I went for years thinking it was, apparently it's not. And, um, my bubble was burst. So um, 
that table, anybody off that table, one thing, <laughs> fundamental flaw within that. Child was alone. Child was alone. Brilliant. This one, this table, anybody? Too young. Too young. Couldn't even reach the floor from the chair. This table? Wasn't allowed to put him off, didn't they? Cut him off at every opportunity. This table? Bullying. Bullying. On the verge of, wasn't it? On the verge of fully. Yeah. 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 It's stable. Yeah. That's a stupid thing. Yeah. Oh, thing. Sunny Jim. <laughs> Sunny Jim, all those words. Anything else? Back for me. Intimidate. Intimidate the environment. I'm quite biased. The way the referee was sat behind the table for three months. Maybe they always got made to so set Yeah. Sat in the wrong place. Unconscious bias and made the mind up. Yeah. Anything else from here? It gets a bit black. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Just a language, not not even age appropriate language. Any of the drink. Yeah. Could they help themselves to a drink? Exactly. Didn't offer a drink. Anybody else notice that they also changed the charge? Charge with violent conduct and then changed it to an assault. It just, it's all fundamentally wrong, right? Fundamentally wrong. Where panels are now, has anybody had to go as a witness or anybody been charged in the room um, or had to represent a charge? Has anybody been at a personal hearing? Yeah. Yeah? It wasn't like that, was it? Surely? No? <laughs> Great. So it's come on massively, right? And in terms of young people, that's a really bad example. It's like everything that's wrong with panels. But it used to be like that. It absolutely used to be like that. But in terms of young people, as I'll show you, there is a process now. There is a guide around hearings, right? It's a really useful guide. It goes through everything that happens within a hearing. We're constantly changing and evolving it as people give us feedback. It's quite a fluid document, but it's there and it gives you the run through of everything that will happen to put people at ease. County FA is determined whether it's online, whether it's on Teams or it's face to face. If there was one Thing that COVID did, it gave us chance to reflect about what happened on hearings. Why, why are we bringing people out at this time of night, making them travel across the county to come to a hearing when they can log on Teams? I get there are challenges with Teams. We've had them already tonight. I get there are IT issues. However, if somebody can be in the comfort of their own home, going through the hearing, it has to be better. It has to be. Are you a referee? I mean, if you're assaulted by Mike, right? If you're assaulted by Mike, broad shouldered, if you're assaulted by him, the last thing you want to be doing is sitting in a room next to him, giving evidence about what he did to you. It's got to be better that you're doing it online. And people feel more comfortable and at ease. County witnesses are not on trial. However, it's really important. The one thing I always hear is that people aren't happy as witnesses that they come out and feel like they've been absolutely grilled. It's an inquisitorial process. You do have to be asked questions. It's uncomfortable. It's not nice. I understand that. I get that completely. But it's really crucial and really important. That parent on that slide earlier we showed who was a witness his evidence is crucial, absolutely crucial to that person receiving a sanction. But he's going to be asked some uncomfortable questions because if I'm Paul Jones, the person who went and assaulted the referee or had physical contact with the referee, I've got the ability as the defendant to ask questions of the witness. So we get it uncomfortable, but we try to make it as comfortable as possible for you. There is an under 18 protocol to make sure under 18s are really at ease because it can impact on them mentally it can impact on them as young people and then it's preliminary matters which are all things that are dealt with before it's about reasonable adjustments if somebody hasn't got a laptop they haven't got wi-fi at home what do we need to do do we need to bring them into the county fa do we need to sit with them and support them there's loads of things that we need to ask and make sure that people are comfortable for a hearing so we're getting on some bits now about actually some of these questions here and some of the things that have come up and part of the agenda that Gary wanted delivering. Panels work on an ability where they have 
a matrix and they'll go from low, medium and high ranges. And they'll start at a point and then they'll consider aggravating and mitigating factors. We'll look at what aggravating and mitigating is a little bit later. It's at the sole discretion of that panel. The crucial thing here I want to try to address and get across is it's not for the county FA to decide whether you are guilty of something or not. The county FA simply follow evidence, ask questions and raise a charge or close the matter. If they raise a charge, it's then in the hands of an independent panel to determine on that evidence whether a charge is going to be found proven or not. And it is that independent panel that makes the decision, not the county FA. So if you're unhappy about the outcome of something, it's not Gary or Mike's fault. It will be down to a panel and their decision based on the evidence. So what can be given? Suspensions, of course, days or matches. A monetary fine can be given. A ground ban can be given. And that actually is a ground ban for the participant. But equally, it can actually ban a team from playing with spectators for so many matches. So they can order it behind closed doors, dependent on the severity of the incident. Disciplinary penalty points for the team. This is not to be confused with point deductions. The amount of times I see and hear a club complain because they get their response letter that says they've been deducted or they got 10 disciplinary penalty points and they think it's coming off their league table. It's not. What disciplinary penalty points are, it's a bit like basketball. It's an accumulation of points. For every yellow card, every red card and every misconduct sanction, you get disciplinary penalty points and they add up cumulatively. And when you reach a threshold, that can then trigger another charge. So when you see on a charge letter and a response for the clubs in the room that says you've got 10 disciplinary points, do not panic and think they're coming off your league table. You can get education orders. You can be given cost orders. Great example of this player got sent off, went to the changing rooms. The club official followed the player to the changing room. The player, in anger, smashed his foot through the door. So the player got a misconduct charge for their behaviour, but also then got a £600 order on top to pay the club for the damage to the door that it cost for them to fix that door. So panels can consider cost and compensation orders. And point deductions, different to disciplinary penalty points. I've just talked about disciplinary, pen disciplinary penalty points. This is point deductions. It is new, it hasn't happened yet, but it will, it is going to. We're near the start of the season, but nobody's triggered yet penalty points that are going to come off league tables. I'll run through this and then we'll take a quick break. So the scope is this. This affects teams from step six and below. So below will include youth and will include men's football that's outside the football pyramid. And it's in the women's game tier three and below. Just to confirm there that the sanction guidelines, they apply across grassroots football. They don't, however, cover some of the academy teams that are playing in Premier League, EFL, Women's Super League, Women's Championship. This is how it's going to work. It is a pilot, it is new. Does it go far enough? It might not. But this is where we're at currently. Aggravated offences. The rules are this, it is covered under rule 3.4 in the regulations. And it's about the club, which is the team, in terms of how many aggravated offences that they commit in a calendar year. It is based on calendar year, not football season. And this is the guidance on it. In terms of the rule, it uses the word club. However, don't confuse the word club, meaning a club of 50 teams. In regulation, the word club actually does mean team for this purpose. 
because it has to be fair. If you've got a team of, uh, sorry, if you've got a club of 50 teams and your men's team commits one offence and your under 11s commits an offence, who are you going to give the point deduction to? That doesn't make sense. So it's got to be based on the team. And it's where they commit two offences in that calendar year of aggravated offences. And as I said earlier, aggravated offences are something where you might say something that's aggravated by race, by colour, by sexual orientation, by disability, by transgender, by nationality, by colour. If, as a team, you have two of those offences in a calendar year that are found proven by a National Serious Case Panel, you then will receive another charge, a third charge, which will be strict liability based on deducting points from your record. Because you've had two proven offences, it's proven. You can't deny them, they've been proven. You've had your chance to deny them. It is then solely down to a panel and their discretion how many points they are going to order to be taken off your league table standing. It hasn't happened yet because they're quite new and we're fresh still into a season. If anybody's committed two aggravated offences in a team and we've only just come into November, then there is a serious problem within that team, I would suggest, within their ethos. It also happens where the team has committed two offences of serious offences on a match official. Physical contact or attempted physical contact, assault or attempted assault on a match official. So it's all in the regulations in 92.2 for those that know rule and reg. Again, it's in a 12 month period. Now, the difficulty is going to be this. If it happens and it shouldn't, and I say it shouldn't because it's when it happens in youth football, I really, really struggle to believe that a youth team is going to have two cases of physical contact or assault on a match official. I don't believe it's going to happen. I would be shocked if it happens. But because it's based on a calendar year, there is going to be a challenge over how you track the team from one season to the next. And that's where we've got to get the system right that it tracks teams through age groups. Because what happens when red line under 15s has discipline problems and at the end of the season, they then go and change the name to become Royal Oak under 16s. Our system needs to be able to track to remember that they've had one in the previous season and now they've got a second. So they deserve to have point deductions. Why doesn't it just be done all the season then? Surely that's easier for everybody on the system. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was discussed season, calendar year. The rule reg was made as calendar year. And it's one of those things, like I said, is it harsh enough? Maybe not. Is it right that it's based on calendar year, not season? Maybe not. But that's where we're at. That's what's gone through as the regulation. Calendar year is a longer period than calendar year. Season's only got seven weeks. Yeah, and, and maybe it is harder, harder hitting. Calendar year will still work. However, it's just in youth football, we have to make sure the system is sophisticated enough to map the age group. But I say this hand on heart, I genuinely believe, I don't think there's going to be that many cases. You might disagree. However, I just don't see how in youth football they're going to commit those serious offences to that degree. I don't know, you know, you apply transferred player from one club another he's passed on did you kept did you did you follow you yes you could follow the player at the moment the answer is no but that might come next because actually it might be the same player that is likely to commit the second offense if it is within their maple however if they're committing one of these offenses certainly around contact with referees they won't come in the calendar year because they'll be suspended for such a period of time it takes them out of the calendar year period anyway because the suspension will be essentially more than a year. It's where it's aggravated, it might be the same player because they might get six matches with aggravated offences. Yes. So it's more about the aggravated offences, I think, where it's going to happen in youth football. Because actually, in youth football, they potentially have no filter and don't understand sometimes the impact of the word they're saying. 
they'll say something because it's what they hear all the mates say and they don't understand sometimes what that word might mean. And that's about how we educate those young people. So it's likely to be the aggravated offences that we're going to have a problem trying to capture and to track them through a calendar year. That might be the challenge we have. Physical contact and assault, I genuinely don't believe in youth football we're going to see it. I, yeah, from Spain. Yeah. Because when a player gets gets charged with that offence, nine times out of the ten, what that the registered for, what they register them, they won't have anything to do with them. So that the player has got to go and find somewhere else. And that's where the second club yeah. could could fall into the trap. But the suspension for those would be so severe that they're going to be suspended for over a year anyway. So they're not before in that calendar year period. If that makes sense. So the other thing to say here, which is really important, is that a club, a team could have one proven case of a, an aggravated offence. They could also have one proven case of a contact on a match official or assault. That doesn't trigger point deductions because it's one of each offence. So for the moment, they've been separated out. It may be in future, after the pilot and after this has all happened, they may merge them. They may merge them. But that's where we're at at the moment. That's what FA Reg Legal have agreed and has gone through, that it's based on calendar year, two or more offences on match officials, two or more offences that are aggravated. OK. Don't need to go through that bit. Now, that's the sanction. The top one is the aggravated bit. The bottom one are offences on match officials. If they get two proven cases, whichever way around it is aggravated or contact on a match official, a panel are going to consider between three to six points that will be immediate removal from their table. If they commit a third offence in the in the calendar year, it's then potentially four to nine points immediately from the table. And if they get to a fourth offence, their third breach of the regulation, it's six to twelve points immediate. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm player. I'm a player for the Royal Oak. My friend here is a player for the Red Lion, and I say something to him. The referee might hear it. We're both having a bit of a punch up, violent conduct. We end up on the floor. This individual is black and I might call him the N-word. And the referee hears it, reports it, supreme facing matter. Referee sends me off for the use of that word. That's aggravated by race, colour. Yeah. OK, so it's the word rather than the point. Uh, it, yeah, so it could be it could be a word. It could be behaviour. Because you've seen people make sort of certain salutes, for example, that would be ag aggravated by nationality. Infamously, um, people making salutes that are around uh, Germany, Nazi salutes that are potentially then aggravated by nationality. No, no, so that would be violent conduct. So that wouldn't be within here. So aggravated is more about something that is about protected characteristics of people yeah, yeah. about yeah gender sexual orientation disability disability and sexual orientation actually in this region are the biggest ones nationally it's about race but interestingly in the north sexual orientation and disability are the ones here that are the most and it's just about words that, that mainly young players will use without really understanding it's just what they hear in the playground potentially and they will they'll use it against each other but that's the Joe Public will take offence to those words. That's a problem. It's one sense of the way on what you feel it is, or what I feel it is. Exactly. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the acid test really would be what would 
would a normal person walking down the street feel about that word said? Would they take offence? And if they would, in general, then you have to raise a charge to test. The youngster, show me a question. So the charge would have to be raised because it's been said, right? It's all about what I used earlier, aggravating and mitigating factors. It's all about mitigating factors. If then that young person explains and they have representation that explains they don't know what they meant by that word, they didn't understand what they meant by the word, they show remorse, there could be education of the young person, which has a better impact than a sanction of suspension. All those things a panel will consider. They're not just going to get six games as a suspension when they've said something because they don't know what they mean they've said. Right. So it's about that panel understanding. Context, reference, situation. And it will then be a very different sanction. OK. Pull the break. Just going to get a couple of minutes. Um, stretch your legs, toilet. <laughs> Tea and coffee if the water's still hot. Then um, we'll just go on to a couple of other bits before we uh, look to bring to a close.
Yeah. 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 Okay, is everybody refreshed? <laughs> so, just while we had a quick break, um, there's a load of good stuff over there that we're having a look at. We might not get through everything in the Q&A later, questions later. What we are going to do, when we send the slides out, we're going to address all the points that have been raised over there. You send some like FAQs out, OK? So we'll take some of those questions and then answer them after if we don't get through them all tonight. Um, really good point that was just made in the break to me. Why should it be two cases of physical contact or assault on a match official? Why should it be two? Why should it not be immediate? I get that totally. Why shouldn't it be immediate? One's enough. And I think the FA understand that as well. And I think that's something that's always going to be open minded and they'll keep that. It is where we're at at the minute. It's two offences. And I think part of the rationale is this, that maybe they should be given an opportunity as a club to amend. Because if I see the red miss, then I go and show a referee for sending me off. The club can't do anything about that. It's in the moment. I've done it on the pitch. People can't stop me from doing it. I've seen the red miss. Totally, I've lost it. Is it fair the club get whacked with a fine and six penalty points from their table? Is it fairer that the club get the opportunity to make amends? There is an issue about the support of the referee, and I understand that, but that's where the peer support, pastoral support with Steve and the team come in. But there is that, there is that view, is one actually too much? Of course it is. Actually, we don't want any referees assaulted or physical contact making with them. So there's been loads of good stuff and loads of good conversation that's been happening, which is brilliant to see. I just talked about mitigating and aggravating words earlier, and there's just a bit of a list there of them. And it just talks about there what I've said. Should the club be given the opportunity to amend? Of course they should. The club might take responsibility. The club might remove the individual. Do they remove the individual and it just transfers somewhere else? That individual goes somewhere else and becomes a problem for somebody else. Yes, inevitably that's going to happen. Of course it will. Or they don't. Actually, aggravating factors is the club show no remorse and no accept no responsibility whatsoever. You might get hit with the full amount of penalty points rather than the least. So that's what we mean, mitigating and aggravating. Some might make it better for you, some might not. There's always a right to appeal to the FA. Of course, there is. Our decisions have to be a right to appeal. The processes will always be on your result letters, so I'm not going to labour the points around the appeal process. What an appeal is, however, what I will say, uh, people confuse the appeal process to be a rehearing. They might not like the outcome of a disciplinary panel's decision, so they appeal thinking they're going to get a different outcome. That's not what it's there for. What it is there for is to amend or accept if there is mistakes that have been made, like the individual who says, I cannot believe he's here again tonight and has sat on four of his previous cases, that individual gets hit with a year ban and a hundred pound fine. That individual appeals to the FA. That individual is going to win. Without a doubt, that individual will win because we failed to give that appellant a fair hearing absolutely by putting somebody on a case who sat there four times before they will win and then it is actually likely that the county fa who put that person on that panel knowing that person sat there will get hit with a cost order in this last 12 months there's been one cost order in this county uh, in this region not in this county sorry gary before gary starts sweating um and the county fa had to pay 700 pound in costs because the county FA submitted a panel, uh, a case pack to a panel 
and it was missing the club's response. The panel heard the case and considered aggravating factors because the club didn't take responsibility. Actually, they did. The panel just didn't get to see it because it was missing. She failed to give them a fair hearing and the county FA were charged £700 costs for that mistake. The landscape in Cheshire, I just want to show you these slides. This is taken over a three year period. We've now got some really good data. The clicker doesn't work on uh, the screen. So this is 2021 season, 21, 22, 22, 23. The numbers in red are the starkest figures. 2021 season was still hit by COVID. 223 misconduct charges were raised in Cheshire. 223. 21-22, it went up to 313. And in 22-23, it went up just by two charges. That actually is not following the trend nationally as such, because the trend nationally is it's going up quite considerably, whereas Cheshire, it remained quite stable over the last two seasons. But that's a lot. That's a lot of misconduct. The ones in orange are the offences against match officials. It's gone from 52 to 80 to 100, where referees, match officials have been abused. That's hand gestures towards match officials, which you all know what they are. I'm sure you perhaps see them week in, week out. Or that's words against match officials that are said. Interestingly, the threats to match officials have stayed stable, eight, seven and six. So it's gone down slightly, but negligible. Physical contact is four, eight and six. Worryingly, assault or attempted assault has gone from zero to two to five. That's quite concerning. However, what is good, I can say the word good, is that it's being addressed in that actually cases are being raised and individuals are being taken out of the game. Rightly so. And aggravated offences, we talked about those protected characteristics. It's gone from 12 to 17 to 28. It's going up all the time. And we talk here, clubs, 94 charges, then 143, but then we've been able to split them out. So it's 82 club charges against team officials and participants, 45 against parents. So actually more charges have been raised about team officials and team participants than there has against parents. Sorry, can I just ask you, do you think that's driven more by offences or by referees now feeling that it's appropriate to put it in? Yeah, um, I don't think we're ever going to know the answer because I don't know how we've got that data. Is reporting made more widely available and better? I think it is, so people know how to report now. Are referees more confident in reporting because they've got more confidence that something happens with their reports? I think it is. I think in terms of the work that the referee team do at Cheshire, I think referees will understand how to report. Because interestingly, the biggest thing with training referees is, one thing that's missing is they don't get to know how to report things in their training. And I think that's being addressed. Seems crazy that you become a qualified ref and then don't get any information on how to report things. Seems crazy. But that's being addressed. So I, I think the whole climate of how to report is being addressed. And I think people have got more confidence. This is about timescales, and I've used this just to show you, because what I do know is there was some frustration a year, a year and a half ago, about how long cases were taking to deal with. So you see here, cases from abandoned matches overall were taking 65 days. Cases that needed a personal hearing were taking 113 days. Non-personal hearings were taking 93. And the average for all misconduct was 94 days total. That was the 21-22 season. The 22-23 season, you'll see the figures have come down dramatically. Now that was partly because of the impact that COVID had, that they almost doubled in case volume, that then staff are under pressure to deal with double the case volume that's coming in. 
And also then with a change of strategy, what Steve and the team have implemented, Mike now has more time in terms of supporting the disciplinary process. The team are able now to reflect on that change in that climate. Now they've got more reports in to be able to deal with them. And it's made a massive, massive difference. Massive difference. Gone down from 94 to 52. Now you still go, 52 days is still too long. I get that, it's nearly two months still, isn't it? But we've talked about reasons as to why this evening and shown you some exercises as actually to why the county FA do sometimes need that amount of time. And if somebody wants a personal hearing, if you remember what I said earlier, if they want a personal hearing, they've got to have 14 days notice. So that's already 14 days. And when they're charged, they get 14 days to respond. So that's 28 days. So that's 28 days you've already done in the process. So they've actually done a tremendous job in addressing that. And this shows you, it's just another way of showing how it's changed dramatically. In 21-22 season, 59% of the cases were being dealt with inside 91 to 180 days. And that shifted. They're now delivering 58% of the cases in 22-23 season in under 45 days. There's been a massive shift. And that's testament to the work that Gary and Mike are doing and being supported by, uh, by Nadine and by Ryan. Now, addressing the behaviours. There's not long to go in these slides at all now, OK? This is about nationally cautions that have been issued in the game. This was from the 2021, 21-22 uh, season, the 22-23 season, so you can see the change. Sin bins have gone down. Portions for dissent, so not a sin bin, but actually is about unsporting behaviour for dissent, have gone up. So what does that tell us? Are referees no longer using sin bins and temporary dismissals? Are they reverting to simply just caution a player for unsporting behaviour, for dissent, yes. because it's arguably easier to do. Yeah. That's what the figures might tell you. There's a load of things you might read into it, but the biggest thing for me is that's what that's telling me. OK, a lot of people have put questions about temporary dismissals and sim bins. Is it working? Is it not? Fundamentally, what happened is it got launched and then COVID hit, which caused a bit of a problem because the teams around the country in the counties were going out delivering loads of road shows and then there was no football. And then football came back and I think people actually really forgot what you need to do. You had those, did you have cards in Cheshire? Yeah. You had those cards with all the different eventualities. It's like playing a game. It was like, if I do this, then I can do this and then I can do this. But then if I do this, I might do this. And loads of different scenarios. Referees' heads must have been spinning. Players' heads must have been spinning. So. What they're looking at is temporary dismissals are going to be relaunched in 23-24. This is the referees team area of work. It's not the discipline team. Okay, So it might be another event that Gary might want to look at is whether he can get somebody like Mark Burkett down uh, or somebody from referees team to come in and talk about. We've had questions about quality of referees, referee fees, uh, referees putting themselves on social media and on Facebook and touting themselves to the highest bidder, all these sorts of things that really the refs team are the one that will answer those questions. Um, I, I have my own opinions probably for later on this evening if you want to hear them. Um, one thing the FA are looking into is still having temporary dismissals. So you'll get eight minutes if it's less than a 90 minute match or 10 minutes if it's a 90 minute match. But that temporary dismissal is a yellow card for dissent not a sin bin yellow card. So effectively, it's going to take out this scenario where you can potentially have up to three yellow cards in a game. It might make it a little bit more manageable for referees to understand and for players to simply know, if I commit an offence by dissent, that's my first yellow card. I'm off the pitch for eight to ten minutes. I can come back on, but then any other yellow card I get, whether it's a second dissent or it's for a, a game-related yellow card, that's my game done. I'm finished. So it simply just reverts back to you have two yellow cards. Yeah, and, and it's just trying to make it a little bit more simple. That's one thing they're looking at. But at the minute, 
at the minute, sim bins do remain as they were launched right now. So those scenarios where you can have potential up to three yellow cards in a game. There is also another issue I'll just address right now is it has to be yellow. It can't be blue, it can't be pink, it can't be any other colour. And that simply is down to the lawmakers and the rules and the guardians of the game. They will not allow a different coloured card to be imposed. Not at the minute. It's not in regs, so you can't do it. I know some leagues try to interpret and put that in their regs. Some leagues you might have seen on social media on X, um, formerly known as Twitter, um, where leagues are touting that they're giving blue cards out for temporary dismissals. It's had to stop. They're not actually just allowing the rule to do it, which I know sounds a little bit petty. They're just not allowed to do it. It has to remain as yellow and red cards. And that's the process. Consultation. Consultation will happen with the game. It goes through the discipline subcommittee, the referee com, and it goes to the football regulatory authority, the FRA, who make the rules. It will go through FA Reg Legal, and it has to be something that's then out, that, that's, that's, that's accepted. So we have to do all this campaigning here to get it through the next channels. Body cam. <laughs> A few things were asked around body cam. Um, there were five leagues that went through body cam around the country. There was not one piece of footage submitted. The process of body cam was they wore them. It didn't record. They had to record when they believed there was going to be a scenario happening. There was not one piece of footage submitted. There was not one offence. Now, the problem is this. It's not a big enough baseline to say for sure that body cams is the deterrent that stops abuse of refs and match officials. Because it's only a small baseline that we've been working on as a pilot to begin with, to see how it all happens and how you record and how it gets stored. It's been extended to a number of leads, and we'll see how that baseline is affected and whether we then get any footage that gets submitted and how we deal with it as a case and how we deal with it as evidence. So th this still here was taken from the 2022-23 review of discipline from the FA. Is there any analysis to see are there further in leagues discipline records line up against the first five leagues to see if there's any sort of uh, change in impact? Yeah, so this was the problem because the baseline in the leagues was so small. Not collected, but yeah, so the services. one, is there a selection issue? Arguably, there might be. What they're now looking at is data for all leagues nationally to try to find those leagues where there's a big baseline to begin with so we can see how it impacts. However, arguably, the leagues with the biggest baseline to start with are going to be bigger leagues. So then it means how on earth are we logistically going to kit all the referees out because there's going to be so many of them from a financial point of view to take part in that trial. There was a finite amount of money, I believe, that was available. So we just they just went for a few smaller leagues to begin with to see how it actually just physically worked. The problem is the baseline data was so low, we don't know if it's affected it positively or not enough. You would just say there's been no footage received. Referees haven't been abused. It's got to be a good thing, right? <laughs> but it's those bigger leagues. When we, when we do the next phase and we choose some of the bigger leagues, we kick the referees out. Are we still going to get zero? Because if we are, then you're going to go. Well, the baseline was quite high. Now it's zero. It's got to have had a massive positive. <laughs> when you say when you say bigger than, uh, was the selection criteria based on cards per team, or was it based on total cards? Because there's a there's a separate issue there as well. It was based on the county FA that wanted to express an interest because they had potentially got a league that they thought had discipline problems. Now, arguably, you might go. Well, maybe they didn't have discipline issues. They might have done because they're such a small league. But if they're such a small league, one or two offences against match officials is a lot. But then the problem is if they've got zero, is it because of body caps? Because you're going from two to zero. It's, it's not an efficient way of looking at data. What was the lowest tier that went down to? Uh, it, uh, there was um, Sunday, Sunday League, Sunday League that's not in National League system. So there was a Sunday uh, pub league that... Uh, one point two. That would be the lowest. Then there was um, step uh, step six. The I think implemented it in one of their divisions, and then there was a youth league, um, and a Saturday outside national league system. So there was a bit, there was a bit of a race just to see how it went. 
There's nobody in this. There's nobody in this county FA. There's no league in Cheshire. Okay, we can talk a bit about body cams if there's any questions later. So, just in terms of addressing behaviours, this is really only relevant for accredited clubs, right? Accredited clubs do have disciplinary processes in place nationally, and accredited clubs can lose their status or have it suspended based on their club and team's discipline internally. I'm not going to talk about what stages implement what punishment, OK, because that's for the county FA staff and that's for them to work with their accredited clubs. But just so you know, there is a process where accredited clubs can be brought to task. You can have a look at those slides in detail after tonight. Now, leagues. There's a regulation where leagues can remove memberships of players. It's not used, in my opinion, enough. It used to be that a player used to have to be part of that league and commit offences in that league to be removed from membership. But what happens? I'm that player. I've got 10 or more matches or 112 days or more in suspensions. The league say to me, we're removing your membership. You're no longer welcome in this league. Fair enough. I'm just going to go and register for a team down the road and go to that league. I'm just going to move. That was removed to allow the league down the road to stop the membership of the player as well. What it needs, however, is it needs a good communication piece between all leagues. They communicate with each other and share data and intel. It will drive players out of the game who have committed these offences. Some leagues, when I used to work with them, they're not bothered. They want to get, they'll give them another opportunity. They'll just say, yeah, come to our league and let's see how you go in our league. Fine. That's that's what they want to operate. That's for them. The process is this. From the first offence of that player, a two-year period is triggered. It's got to be an accumulation. If a player receives a year ban, for pushing a referee once he's got a red card, it doesn't trigger this because it's got to be two or more offences. But they could be red cards. There could be red cards included in that. So I'll just come to you in a second. Um, so if I do that and the leagues in Cheshire are sharing my data, every league in Cheshire can turn around, even though I've not done it in the Cheshire Sunday League, I've done it in the Cheshire Saturday League, the Sunday League can take the Saturday League's record and tell me I'm not welcome in their league. I try and join, they say I'm not welcome because I've triggered that. So then I try and then go and join the Liverpool Sunday League. And the Liverpool Sunday League, as long as they're talking to Cheshire, can say you're not welcome because your record has triggered that effect and you're not welcome in our league. So it's not used enough. They also can remove teams from membership. AGM, EGM, SGM. Critically, it has to be done constitutionally. And what I mean by that is you have to follow your own league rules and make sure you're following them to the letter. Because if you do not, you are likely to lose an appeal. It's happened time and time again this year. A league wants to remove a club that is bad, that is committing offences continuously. Example being, League want red line removing. They write to every club member in their league, except for the red lion. And they say, we're calling a meeting, we're calling an SGM to have a vote on removing the red lion because they're bad eggs. But the red lion know nothing about it. They have a vote and the red lion get a letter from the league saying you've been removed by a membership vote. That is unconstitutionally and it is unfair. Red lion will appeal. They will win. You will have to reinstate them. You can go through the process again and make sure you've done it fair, but you would have to reinstate them. Because it has to be fair. The red line have to get the same communication as everybody else. They are a member. They can be invited. They can have their say because I'm the league and I'm saying they're bad eggs. They've had two proven cases of misconduct. A member club want them out. We're going to have a vote, but we're going to let the red line have their say to be put their point across why they shouldn't be removed. Let's have a vote. 
out or in. And as long as you've done that and you've covered all bases, red line appeal your decision to remove them, they are likely to lose because you have done it transparently and fairly. Yeah, simple. Same principle with clubs. Some people have asked this question. Clubs have codes of conduct. Follow them. Follow your code of conduct. If there's been an alleged breach, do the same as the county FA, investigate it. But make sure you've got a group of people that you can trust within the club that can do that role. Investigate it. And if you say you've breached our terms and conditions and our codes of conduct, you're going to be, no, you're going to be members of our club no longer because we're going to use our expulsion policy and registration. We're removing you from the club. Let them have an appeal process in your club. A group internally take that decision. They appeal it to key members of the committee of the club. It's fairness. Outcome's the same, it's the same. You remove them, and as long as you go through that process, you are on sound ground. It's when you do it unfairly, unconstitutionally. So follow your club rules, be clear and transparent in your communication, be fair. Nobody's asked about abandoned match protocol, but the slides are there. Referees should know these. It's just what happens if there is an allegation of um, aggravation. What should happen? What should you do? So the slide is there for you to refer to if you need it. And this is the process about what happens if charges are raised from that allegation. The process that happens and you go through. So wrongful dismissals. Somebody wanted an example, and this is the last thing we're going to do. And it's hopefully a bit of an engaging uh, activity that we're going to do just before we finish. Wrongful dismissals, you can appeal red cards across the game with the exception of a second yellow card or an S6, which is offensive, insulting, abusive behaviour. They are the regs, they are the rules. Some people don't like them, agree, disagree, but that's where it's at. Video evidence isn't required, but it's obviously helpful. And the process is whenever you get a red card, you've got two working days to put your intent into a appeal. On your fourth working day, you've got to have all your evidence. Critically, the test is this. You have to prove and show the referee made an obvious error. That they made an obvious error. Those two key words, they are critical. Right. I hope this is going to work. It's the last thing. If we don't, we finish early. So you're going to see some wrongful dismissals. You've got some paper right down whether the appeal is successful or not from what you see. You're going to see the clip. You'll then get what the offence is. You're then going to see the clip again. So you'll see it twice. Make your decision. That's what you're saying. There's an appeal process with red cards. Yep. That's probably the impression we did that one. Yep. Unless we have video evidence. Nope. But just keep that in mind. Bear, bear that in mind. What happens if your notification is late in two days after the yeah. if your if your appeal goes in after two days, your intent, my advice but the notification off the red card was to four days in. We'll, we'll come to that after. Cool. We'll come to that after. Okay, so let's go through these. Because we might get to nine. Actually, I said no, it's only in two hours, but here we go. So here's the first one. Player was sent off denying a goal scoring opportunity. Two, be sent off for denying a goal scoring opportunity. A referee has to consider those things there. The direction of travel, the distance between the goal and the player and the offence. Is there any covering players? Was the player likely to have the ball under control or not? And was there a genuine attempt to play the ball? So you have to satisfy those things. What the clip again? So, keep it to yourselves. Should that red card be rescinded or not? Should the red card be expunged or not? Should the red card remain? Other supermarkets are available. <laughs> Peel two. Yeah. 
Good. Serious foul play. Serious foul play is when a player who lunges at an opponent challenging for the ball from the front, from the side, from behind, using one or both legs with excessive force or endangers the safety of the opponent, is guilty of serious foul play. Watch it again. Okay, so should that red card be rescinded or should the red card remain? Third appeal. Get slow back this one. So violent conduct. Violent conduct when a player uses or attempts to use excessive force or brutality against an opponent when not challenging for the ball or against a teammate, team official, match official, spectator or any other person, regardless of whether contact is made. <laughs> Which incident was the red card in? Not what they're saying. The The red card is against the second player there. Appeal four. So that's the challenge that broke Ellen White's at the moment. Dog so, denied a goal scoring opportunity. Yeah, yes. Same back. principle, watch that again. <laughs> and this is number five. The club submitted um, a written response, which they can do, but they don't need video evidence. OK. So, appeal one. The denied a goal scoring opportunity with Sainsbury's in the background. By the way, I showed you that. Um, <laughs> you might disagree with these, but it is ultimately a panel's decision whether they believe the referee was obviously wrong with the evidence they're seeing. The appeal was dismissed, the red card remained. Couldn't show the referee made an obvious error. Some people said it was outside the area, just slightly outside, might have been. Was it obvious? No. Appeal two. Red card for serious foul play remained. I, I think that was probably a bit of a given on that second one where the player came into the side. Appeal three. The red card for violent conduct was expunged. The player, secondly, who came in, if you saw the slow mo, it looked like was already sort of trying to duck out of the way. Didn't really look at where they were going, but didn't really try to use excessive force to take the player out. They didn't know what was happening. It was removed. Number four, the Ellen White clip. It was expunged. Interestingly, the panel said if the referee had sent the player off a serious foul play, yeah. it might have remained. Yeah. But it wasn't. It was submitted as a denying a goal scoring opportunity. And five, the appeal was dismissed. If you're going to submit an appeal with no video evidence, it's highly likely you're not going to win. Highly likely. It's there for a reason, though, that you might have some really good evidence without video. You might have a referee assessor. You might have the referee that says, do you know what? I made a mistake on reflection. So that doesn't mean you're going to win, but it has to be there as an opportunity to submit. Did anybody get five out of five? Yeah. yeah. Hands up if you got five out of five. Hands up clearly if you got five out of five. That's a bit hard isn't it? Yeah. Oh, this six. <laughs> oh, we've got six, haven't we? Right, OK. Those people who got, those people who got five, come and see me at the end. There is a tie break, and it was about Vauxhall Motors. 
and that is the end and we've got questions now um i just want to address something there that came up a uh, question about you don't know you might have a red card regulation will say teams will know if they've got a red card a manager will know if a player has been red carded if that red card doesn't come in your system in two days the process is you contact the county fa to say i've not got it but i want to appeal it because it was wrong and i've got video evidence whatever that is intent to appeal some teams and clubs used to wait because they used to think they were going to get away with it that it wasn't going to get submitted the problem is you've then lost your right to appeal because the process is so stringent and tight if your intent comes in after two working days the answer is no because it has to be fair to everybody else if the county fa says yes they have to say yes to everybody it has to be fair and transparent the problem is if you get a red card the suspension starts seven days after so it's a really tight process and it has to be for that reason two days to intent to appeal two more days to put it in with all your evidence it has to be heard then on the fifth day to get it in so your player knows if they are red carded or not i understand actually you might fall foul of that sometimes and it's a real bitter pill to swallow i get it i totally get it but that's what it is that is the process so referees are bound to submit everything within 48 hours if they don't they are liable to then face misconduct charges themselves he has cut my out of the end of the and now Gary, Gary might few times this season later. Few other refs that's done one four weeks later, the other one was five weeks. Yeah. I told him we had the players suspended. I told him we had the Yeah. So this is what we ask. You shouldn't have you shouldn't have to. But you might need to tell them because that player needs to go in the system as a suspension. So it is a little bit reliant on no, clubs being honest said, with us. I told them. Yeah. I told them started. Should be then seven days from that Friday. No, the suspension could start the day after. Cause it, cause it was four weeks late. That's yeah. a club that's not our fault, is it? So what, what happens to that mess? So that is where, it, on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, you can contact the county, ask the county what will happen, what happens. It will depend and it will vary. There are some young referees, let's say this happened in youth football. A referee has just qualified, has come through the system, 14 years of age, not quite sure what has to happen a little bit naive misses the 48 hour deadline well, what happens do we sanction them and suspend them is that in the best interest of the game i might argue not however if it has a massive impact and the player then goes and plays under suspension there is an issue with that side of it and i get that but it's all about context and it will all be based on what the county decides should happen in that context but I wouldn't, to be fair, I wouldn't make phone calls and pause and you know, that was so they have to be able to know. Yeah, and that's why I talk about the context. This might be this might be somebody who's been doing it years and years and years. Yeah, could be an, a, a referee who's been doing it years and years and years and should know better. You would argue then that if the referee knows better, you might potentially then issue a charge to the referee for failing to report misconduct. Both, both times, like I said, my guy was silent both times. Both times, but all the same, technical problem. <laughs> yeah. Same reason, twice. So, I mean, as you said before, you put things in place for appeals to get laptops or get them in or whatever. Yeah. And both sides, I could told them a technical problem. I, yeah. I could do one on my phone right now. So yeah. I don't believe that a technical problem is sufficient enough so in, for me. So, in terms of individual things, we'll, t we'll take those up. We can take those up after. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody got any questions at all? Because we are at nine o'clock and I appreciate time and I know Stephen wants a full day, I think, my phone. Can I just ask a question on filming? Yeah. Because this baffles me. Same about filming. Somebody gets a red card. As long as you've got the film, it's it is. When does that film start? Or does it only start when then people decide to switch that camera on because they can have a go with the referee now? And then switch it off. Because their own players are spared. Then the same film goes on yeah, social media. Now, where do we stand with that? Second one into it, the filming is the film again, the referee tells them not to film these young children, they have been bring care. And again, they carry on and it goes on social media. So that is one that I'll pick up after because there's a load of information 
and I hope Nadine to sit online. Um, there's a lot of information about sort of do's and don'ts and a whole policy on filming and confidentiality and what you can do and what you can't do. It's a minefield and it's going to take longer than a couple of minutes to explain. So I, I will definitely pick that one up and I'll send some information out to answer that question. OK. Um, Dave, do you, is it, is it yourself, Steve, or is Dave coming to speak? Or? No, okay. it, I know you've not had a massive amount of time for questions, but if I get Gary just to come up and he, Gary will just do a little bit of close, um, then please feel free to come speak to us after. And as I said, we'll get some FAQs sent out to you after tonight. And if there's anything that's not being addressed, please speak to the county FA, speak to Gary, speak to Mike, and then we'll get some answers for you, all right? Thank you. No, I just wanted to say thanks for everybody for coming and uh, Craig. We have got a token of our appreciation tonight. Um, so if you come come to the centre stage, Craig, for us, and your guest Lester, um, to give a token of our appreciation and thanks to everybody. Thank you. Chairman of Chester County FA, just to formally close the event, but I just really do want to say thank you very much for your support uh, for this event. It's been great. Thanks for uh, emailing me and coming. I know that you've got my emails and everything like that. Um, I don't ignore you, um, not on purpose anyway. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Dave Edwards to close the event for me. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gary. And uh, thank you all, obviously, for. Uh, Coming this evening, and uh, particular thank you to uh, to Lee Gibson there and for the only, for the uninitiated. Um, Lee has provided uh, over the years uh, a fair a fair amount to the uh, to the county coffee <laughs> help help build our new headquarters in the car. Didn't I know? <laughs> and uh, well, what I would like to what I would like to say uh, just quickly about Lee, he he will. He will uh, agree with me that he wasn't the best behaved player in the world when he was <laughs> when he was playing. But what I, what I like to see is the amount that he is putting back into the game now as a uh, as a coach and, and you know all the other things that he does for the game. And there's a lot of other people like like Lee as well who have perhaps not been as uh, well behaved as he should have been in the in the early days of their careers. But uh, it's very important uh, that we keep going. So thanks, uh, thanks for that, Lee, and thanks, um, thanks to to Gary and Greg, obviously, for their um, for their efforts to put the evening on, and, uh, and and a thank you to the rest of the county staff who have uh, who have come this evening to support their colleagues because. Uh, I can tell you that some of them have been in the office since nine o'clock this morning, and by the time they get home tonight, it's going to be well after half past eleven. So, um, so thank you for uh, for your efforts as well. But more importantly, thank you because you know you are the people that make the events. We can put the events on, but if you don't you don't turn up, there's no events. So thank you for um, for coming along, and I hope that you've um, taken something from the evening. And uh, you've enjoyed it as best you can. Um, so thank you very much for for all turning up tonight. Have a safe journey home, and uh, we'll see you all in the future. Hopefully, not in a different environment. Yeah. Right. If anybody has got any questions, we're going to.